Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining our webinar Solidarity today. It is part four in a special series of online events, Russia's War on Ukraine, co-hosted by the Melbourne Eurasianist Seminar Series at the University of Melbourne, the Ukrainian Studies Foundation in Australia, and the Ukrainian Studies Association of Australia and New Zealand. My name is Natalia Chaban. I'm professor at the Department of Media and Communication at the University of Canterbury, New Zealand. I'm president of the Ukrainian Studies Association of Australia and New Zealand, and I will chair today's webinar. Following our serious tradition, I will set the stage first. After that, I will introduce our panelists and our special guest, His Excellency Vasil Maroshnichenko, the ambassador of Ukraine to Australia and New Zealand. The world is witnessing momentous changes in the geopolitical landscape. The aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine unleashed in February 2022 the remarkable global and European solidarity with Ukraine. New divisions and new alliances, including the ones on the European continent, will have a lasting effect on the course of international relations in the 21st century. The world shows its solidarity with Ukraine on many levels. It is about political decisions on the levels of national, multilateral, and supranational governments. On July 23, 2022, the European Council decided to grant Ukraine the status of candidate country for EU membership. In doing so, the Council followed the recommendation of the European Commission issued on the 17th of June of the same year. On that occasion, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, declared that Ukrainians are ready to die for the European perspective. We want them to live with us in the European Union. Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky immediately hailed the EU decision, declaring that it constituted a unique and historical moment in Ukraine-EU relations. Citing Volodymyr Zelensky, Ukraine's future is with the European Union. Solidarity is also about actions in the sphere of economy. The sanctions packages were adopted by many governments around the world in solidarity with Ukraine, and these decisions were made also by governments of New Zealand and Australia. But solidarity is not only about politics and economy, it is for most about people-to-people -people relations. A flash Eurobarometer survey in 2022 in all EU member states shows large consensus among EU citizens in favor of the EU's response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I'm quoting Eurobarometer survey here. The majority of Europeans think that since the war started, the EU has shown solidarity, 79%, and has been united, 63%, and fast, 58% in its reaction. Respondents are widely in favor of the unwavering support to Ukraine and its people. In particular, more than nine out of 10 respondents, 93% approve providing humanitarian support to the people affected by the war, 88% of Europeans approve the idea of welcoming in the European Union people fleeing the war, and 80% approve the financial support provided to Ukraine. The act of aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine triggered a wave of refugees from Ukraine seeking safety in the European Union and around the world, including Australia and New Zealand. According to the United Nations, as of the 30th of August, over 7 million refugees from Ukraine were recorded across Europe with 4 million registered for temporary or similar national protection schemes, predominantly women, children and elderly. Poland and Germany in the EU are hosting most of people seeking refuge. These, the efforts, the solidarity, the compassion by people around the world are noted and appreciated by Ukrainians. In the survey of returning to Ukraine refugees, the Rosenkov Center, the social research group in Ukraine, in the 2022 survey, asked respondents to assess provided assistance. Respondents reported that 64% received assistance from the host country's government agencies, 64 received help from the host country's ordinary citizens who they did not know before, 56% received help from volunteer organizations, 62% said they were very happy with assistance provided, 29 were rather happy. Not a single respondent said he or she was totally dissatisfied with the provided assistance. There will be still um, talks about accession of Ukraine to the European Union. It might be a lengthy process. 
There are fears of thinning interest and support to Ukraine. Global media interest in Ukraine may get less. Also, good news about the counteroffensive recently definitely raised media interest um, once again and in this part of the world. There are fears that donations made by citizens around the world may get smaller while public debates are refocusing on potential negative effects of the war for their own countries. The World Vision report warns of disinformation about Ukraine and its refugees, and such information manipulation could cause breakdown in relations with local communities. This is a key momentum for us to look into these questions in our webinar solidarity today and discuss them with a fantastic group of our presenters. But before I introduce our presenters, I would like to give the floor to His Excellency Vasil Miroshnichenko, Ambassador of Ukraine to Australia and New Zealand, to greet the panelists and the members of the audience. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency Nina Obemeyer. Uh, all, all the um, uh, all the participants of this of this webinar um it's is is the engagement with academic circles as we saw those people who are studying ukraine russia who study eastern europe is extremely important in australia and new zealand there is not much of eastern european studies per se and uh, not that much on ukraine as well uh, for obvious reasons uh, it's too far away uh, there is probably more here on China and Indonesia than, than it is about Eastern Europe. But I think that this war has really opened up um, that big uh, void uh, there, which, which, is, which is missing. Just early today, I did a lecture at the Australian Defence College where I spoke to about 200 students. Uh, this is mid-career students in their pretty much my age who are now studying in the, in the military college. And I've asked them in the room, who speaks Russian here in the room? And, uh, and nobody did, actually. I was surprised. And recently, I spoke, actually, at DFAT. There was a workshop that was both for DFAT and DOD, you know, DFAT, which is Ministry of Foreign Affairs in, in, in Australia. And, and I asked them, in that room, there were 60 people. And I also asked the same question. And only two people spoke uh, Russian language. The reason I ask about Russian language is it, uh, because it tells you a lot how much of people would understand of what's happening in Ukraine because they really need to understand what what why Russia is doing it and and be able to understand it. Of course, uh, I'm a proponent of studying Ukraine and, and studying Ukrainian uh, first uh, to be able to 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 learn about this war to understand what's going on. But 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 it's also about um, uh, knowing your enemy and knowing what Russia is doing will give you many new answers. So I would be more than happy to facilitate cooperation between uh, Australian and New Zealand uh, universities, think tanks, uh, to hook them up with uh, Ukrainian counterparts, uh, because I think the interest towards Ukraine is, is going to be on a rise as we move forward. Um, and um, and uh, yes, uh, I was recently in New Zealand, presented my credentials there. Uh, so, so now I'm covering both countries plus eight uh, Pacific islands. That I'm now responsible for. Uh, it's extremely tumultuous and very hectic these days. Um, I'm never in Canberra, actually. I've been here for Australia for six months, and I think I've been maybe for a month in Canberra. I've been out traveling. I've been to Ukraine twice already. Uh, each trip is over two weeks, and um, and then I've, I've traveled throughout a uh, whole Australia uh, now many times, and um, speaking at different universities, engaging with media, meeting business, um, regional government, uh, central government, and very blessed that there is so much support from Australia coming. It's uh, it's really, Australia is punching above its weight. Uh, it's $400 million uh, in military assistance. And of course, uh, Anthony Albanese making a trip to Ukraine on the fifth week of, his, of him being on a job was really phenomenal. I was very pleased to be there with him, uh, for him to see uh, the level of destruction that Russians have left, uh, to hear the witness accounts from Bucha and all those uh, people who, who were just innocent people who were just killed because they were Ukrainians. And I think it was really an, an eye opener. And I, I remember when we got into the meeting with the president of, of what and how Australian delegation has changed after spending three hours in Bucha, Irpin and Hostomel. Because even for me, I was still in Ukraine when the war started, and I just fled. I was also a refugee myself. I had to evacuate my family to Romania. I got appointed on the way, and then I came here only at the end of March. Um, still, for me, 
telling a story about what you know Russian war crimes and crimes against humanity in the suburbs of Kiev uh, was very difficult. But then actually, when I went there, it was even it was it was even more difficult. But look, um, I want to actually sort of end my introductory remarks on a positive note. 90% of Ukrainians believe we will win the war. Um, the recent news uh, from of liberating the Kharkiv region are very uplifting. And motivation is strong. As you, you've seen, Russian army just collapsed and ran away, li leaving behind lots of kit and ammunition, uh, which actually tells speaks volumes about their morale. And um, as we know, at times of war, it's extremely important uh, to keep it high. We're defending our land. This war is existential for us. Uh, I was just talking to a journalist from ABC just five minutes ago, and he said, look, Russia just can't win this war. They already lost but the day when they invaded. They just can't win it. They can kill us all, but they can't subdue Ukrainians. And I think this is already pretty clear, six months in war, uh, that we'll be fighting. And um, look, I think that's enough. I think that the future for Ukraine is in NATO, it's in the EU. Uh, the only way forward for us is strong military and strong economy. And uh, I, I really was uh, very, uh, in a way, uh, happy, I was very happy to see that when Ukraine received this candidate status to join the, the EU. When I was a student 20 years ago, I was the president of the European Youth Parliament and I ran a Ukrainian chapter. And for me, it was always a dream promoting European integration among young people in Ukraine uh, now actually seeing the finally that we are recognized as a candidate member state. We all know it's the wrong road to go. I think Turkey has been recognized as a candidate member for 50 years now, never, never been able to join. Uh, so I don't want us to be another Turkey. I really want us to join EU soon uh, so that we can rebuild the country and, and, and have prosperous future. So thank you very much. And I think I'll just end here. And it was, it's a great pleasure meeting you. Your Excellency, thank you very much for your welcoming remarks. And um, it is fascinating to hear how busy you are and how much interest in Ukraine in Australia. And, and I can guarantee there is a lot of interest in Ukraine in New Zealand. We're looking forward to, to seeing you in New Zealand and in our universities. And we're working in wonderful collaboration with our Australian colleagues. This webinar is one example of how two countries try to do something. And we are really honored that you could join us today. And we hope you could join two more webinars uh, by the end of the year, two more left. And um, uh, it's been a fantastic cooperation effort. And I'm very grateful to you and to our panelists today. So you set us with excellent ideas and good directions to reflect on. And um, we will continue with the presentations. So thank you for coming. and. Do, do send us questions if you see something in presentations of, of is of interest to you. Thank you. Thank you again. And now my great pleasure is to introduce our first panelist, Her Excellency Nina Obermeyer. Nina has been the ambassador of the European Union to New Zealand since November 2019. Prior to her arrival in Wellington, she was part of the EU negotiating team for the United Kingdom's withdrawal from the European Union in charge of issues related to Ireland, North Ireland. Early in her career as an EU official, she worked on relations with Switzerland, protection and crisis management in the Middle East peace process. Before joining the European Union political institution, she worked in TV journalism. Nina attained her MA in European studies as well as in political science and history. She speaks six languages at different levels of proficiency and is able to work in four, English, German, French, and Dutch. Your Excellency Nina Obermeyer. Nina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia. Kia ora, uh, koto. Good morning, good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me as the representative of the European Union to speak at this webinar today about solidarity as part of a series on Russia's war on Ukraine. And maybe to start with a, with a quick reaction or rather reassurance to what my um, colleague from Ukraine just said, um, the European Union definitely does not have the intention of making Ukraine wait 50 years for accession to the European Union. I think there is, uh, the intention to have this uh, completed, this process completed much, much earlier. Solidarity 
is the theme of today's webinar. And this is also one of the founding principles of the European Union, going back to its origins as a peace project. And Professor Michel Knot will explain much better than me the place that solidarity has in the history of European integration. I will limit myself to uh, some very few bits of history, um, notably the Schumann Declaration of 1950, which we always refer to when we're marking Europe Day, the birth of Europe on the 9th of May. French foreign minister at the time, Robert Schumann, said that Europe will not be made all at once or according to a single plan. It will be built through concrete achievements which first create a de facto solidarity. What Schumann had in mind when describing the fundamental principle of solidarity is the principle of sharing both the advantages, so prosperity, for example, and the burdens equally and justly among the members of the European Union of offering assistance should another member need it. Over the years, this solidarity principle has manifested itself in many ways in the EU, most notably through the cohesion payments, the transfers from the wealthier EU member states to the less well-off members and also to the candidates for membership. At least this is how this principle was applied during peace times. What the Russian military aggression against Ukraine has shown us is that the principle of solidarity, the principle of standing together, supporting each other, transcends the members of the EU. The ruthless face of evil, the frontal assault on Ukraine and also on Europe's security and the international rules-based system that has also made that Australia and New Zealand countries that are very far from Ukraine have sprung into action in solidarity with Ukraine, made also the citizens of Europe rise in solidarity. And Natalia has already quoted um, the quite impressive figures that show um, the conviction of European citizens that this is the right thing to do, to show solidarity with Ukraine. When it took the EU years to respond to the challenges created by the GFC, or weeks, even months, when, when COVID-19 hit, it took us not even one day to stand by Ukraine's side when the war broke out, when Russia invaded Ukraine. To stand by Ukraine's side with weapons, with funds, with hospitality for refugees, and with sanctions destined to deprive Putin's war machine of its fuel, but also with a perspective for EU membership and with funds for the reconstruction of Ukraine. And uh, we are just looking at how we can quickly rebuild uh, the more than 70 schools that have been completely destroyed in Ukraine since the war started. It also took Europe, European citizens, only one day to throw open our borders, to open our homes to Ukrainian refugees. I was in Brussels um, in July, so only a couple of weeks ago, and um, there um, Ukrainian uh, schools uh, set up. So Ukrainian children are going uh, into the EU schools, but in order to keep um, the Ukrainian language alive and to also uh, teach in Ukraine, and there, there are small schools popping up everywhere um, in Brussels. At the start of this school year, more than half a million Ukrainian children are attending schools in the European Union. Poland has welcomed many more refugees than any other member state. As everywhere in the EU, a Ukrainian that arrives in the EU immediately has the right to housing, access to health uh, services, to schooling, to social housing, um, and the right to work as well as to, um, to um, social security payments. Poland has welcomed uh, about 2 million people. And I believe Professor Zdzisław Mark will look at the origins of this immense Polish solidarity with Ukraine. Solidarity with Ukrainians and with Ukraine in Europe is there to stay as long as this war lasts. This is what 
the polls show, this is what the decisiveness that we've shown with regard to the sanction uh, shows. Um, because I think it is important to stress that whilst some um, have criticized the sanctions as not, go, not being far reaching enough, these were decided in full awareness of the fact that they have to remain in place as long as the aggression lasts. So they need to be sustainable. Ukrainians have, um, Europeans have understood that Ukrainians are heroically fighting not only for their country, first and foremost, of course, for their survival and their country, but are also defending European values and European security. And what this understanding means for Europe's relationship with the other, with the new Europe, um, I think will be later examined by Dr. Alessia Kromejczuk. Our solidarity comes at a cost to European citizens. And you hear a lot about the soaring um, energy prices and the cost of living. It is, however, clear to everybody that these costs are small, tiny even compared to the price Ukrainians are paying that are subject to daily shelling. And our solidarity in Europe will be tested in the coming uh, winter and is tested already by those that want to exploit the divisions between us. In addition, Europe's solidarity is also required beyond Ukraine and beyond our borders even further. Putin's war, has not only upended lives in Ukraine, it has also led to a drastic increase in the price of wheat, corn, sunflower oil, fertilizer with consequences far beyond Europe. Europe's solidarity extends also to countries affected by food insecurity. And we've stepped up our efforts to help in the short term, but also in the longer term to increase food security in those countries most affected. This food security crisis makes very clear that as Commission President uh, von der Leyen said only this Wednesday, this is not only a war unleashed by Russia against Ukraine. This is a war on our energy, a war on our economy, a war on our values and a war on our future. This is about autocracy against democracy. And I stand here with the conviction that with courage and solidarity, Putin will fail and Europe will prevail. Noreira, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this insightful presentation in a big turn. So we have um, the European Union, the major neighbor to Ukraine, and the European Union which showing in an immense solidarity with Ukrainian people. Thank you very much, Nina. Our next presenter is uh, Michel Knopf, who is a professor of political science. Uh, is also director of the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence EU at School, chair of the COST Network in the EU foreign policy facing in realities, co-leader of the Leuven Excellence Center Emerging City, and co-leader of the DFG basis for the design of the German uh, sorry, of the DFG research training group technical infrastructure. He has published widely on the European Union, and some of these publications we have co-authored, so I'm uh, very honored that Michelle uh, put our panel today, and um, she is interested in energy and climate governance, and has received research grants from the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, German Federal Ministry of Economic Defense and Energy, the German Research Council, the Volkswagen Foundation, and the European Commission. Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, the connection was very bad. I hope that mine is okay. Uh, if there's a problem, you just tell me. Uh, I prepared some slides for you very quickly, only to introduce you first to the concept of solidarity, which is not an easy one. It's not clear, it's not precise, defined what is solidarity. But as Her Excellency Nina Obermeyer said already, the Lisbon Treaty set off a firework of solidarity within the EU. That uh, concept is popping up many, many times and we are living solidarity moments. Uh, but I want to draw your attention to the fact that there are different types of solidarity and we tackled nearly all of them already at the moment. So I will 
show it to you. You can have a country X and a country Y, and there are people in. So the people can show solidarity within their country and also across the border. And across the border, we will call that a transnational solidarity, which we can witness. And I will talk in a minute about this towards people from Ukraine, either being refugees in their own country or coming across the border to Poland, Germany, and other countries. But we can also have the solidarity between member states. So we have an EU member states, I just put two, there are more, you know that, uh, towards a country, and we have the European Union. So if the European Union or one of the member states is having solidarity acts towards a country, then this is international solidarity. Nina Obermeyer talked about that already. We responded immediately after the breakout of the war, war and uh, have solidarity towards Ukraine as European Union, giving money, giving war material. The, the, each member states did something. So this is an international going over the border of European Union solidarity. We can have a supranational solidarity. Also, Her Excellency put us uh, examples like the, uh, the regional policy, the coherence policy within the EU, but also all what we did now with the Repower EU plan in order to back member states up against the energy crisis, which is deepened by the war. And then we can have uh, intergovernmental solidarity. That means uh, member states among each other, bilateral, multilateral, can be solidarity. And I will pick up two examples, one on transnational solidarity and one small one on international governance today. And I would like to start with uh, the transnational solidarity, the solidarity by the people, uh, which was as Nina Obermeyer said, it was an immediate wave of solidarity with the, within the German society after February 21st of 2022. Uh, and it was not the state, the state always needs to react. There have been structures to build up, but the people were there from the first moment. And uh, we saw big solidarity rallies here in Berlin. You can see thousands of people, but it was not only in the big um, cities, it was, I just put some pictures of my own city. It's only 35 inhabitants, but this was 25th of February, a day after the invasion. Uh, people were coming together, which you cannot see now very nicely is that the, the Ukrainian colors were at the town hall and we were standing there in solidarity and there were prayers and, and speeches and that continued long time. You can see here, um, the, the crowd was growing, it was spread the news that you come together to talk about the war and what can we do. Um, and there were the colors of Ukraine all over, this is our water tower, um, and a lot of flags in each house to show solidarity. But people also did something, so here's a, a sign when people were arriving at the train stations, like in Frankfurt, Berlin, and all the big cities because people very quickly, the, the state decided that Ukrainians can go on trains in Germany without paying. So to have it easier to move people through the country. Um, and there were people grouting and trying to organize where to sleep, where to put the families, what to do with the children. And this was a whole network in each German city. And we could um, draw to our experience in 2015, when especially the Syrian refugees were coming, um, we can we could just build up again the same network structure of civil society. And also very quickly, there were big cars going to the border to provide people with goods, which they needed, but also going back with people in the cars. And what I was, what I find fascinating is that it's not, well, these are the usual people who are helping, but it's through all parts of the society. So the enterprises were doing something. Um, the universities, I just put here one example because we have that big cost network, um, which I'm leading and Natalia Sherman uh, pointed to. And there was a colleague from Ireland asking myself, um, asking me, 
Well, um, we have a, a young scholar here with four kids uh, and they are in Kiev, they have to go away. Uh, is there any possibility in the network that somebody can take them and give them a, a job or help them going out the country? And actually that young lady, I didn't know her, Katarina Tsarembo, a wonderful scholar and her research fitted to our research and with the help of the university and a big research project, uh, we succeeded to have her here now for a year with full accommodation and a job. And these kinds of helping in academia, using the networks to get people out, to help people on their way, to get them jobs was fully in place. And I'm, I must say that was really fascinating and still is because they're still coming people and we try to help. So uh, Germany at the moment, there are around 1 to 1.5 million Ukrainian refugees. It's not so easy to count because we have visa-free regimes, so we actually don't know exactly how many are in the country, but these are the ones who are registered and who get the full help from the state. From the beginning on, as they are registered at the same moment, they have full access to health insurance. They can stay several years within this helping system. Um, so but also a lot of people, they just went to the stations and they said, okay, we have place for one family with so many kids, dogs, whatever was coming and just come. And these people are most of the time still in those families. They try to get settled in the normal accommodation market, but that is not so easy. And we expect a lot more coming now in winter, especially if the bombing, Russian bombing of infrastructure um, is continuing. Uh, then we will get run into problems because capacities are really full, cities are struggling, they cannot find places. So unfortunately, because also the other refugee numbers in winter are rising, Syrians and so on are still coming. Um, there might be not so nice pictures again from people having to stay in uh, gymnastic halls or big, big halls um, to accommodate then before you can find places. But there's also intergovernment solidarity, and I will finish with that one quickly. And you know, it was also mentioned, we have an energy crisis in Europe and especially in Germany, because Germany was unfortunately 55% dependent on Russian natural gas before the war. And this was also because we said we cannot have from the first moment on full sanctions on gas, because then our, our economy will collapse. Uh, the gas crisis could lead to outages in winter because we have 50% of natural gas in Germany is used for heating, 35% for industry and a little bit for um, electricity. And it, for sure, we will not come, even with our um, storage now full or nearly full, we will not come over the winter without shortages. First, it will hit the industry. This is... is um, um, regulated by the EU SOS regulation that first the industries has to be shut up and the la latest the people. So people should not stay in um, cold houses. And there is also a solidarity act here. That means that if industry is shut off, but people, it's not enough gas supposed in Germany for the people, then the other surrounding neighbors or neighbors who have a gas connection to Germany have to provide Germany with gas. And this is um, a huge burden also for the others surrounding us, Belgium, Netherlands especially. And this kind of solidarity can have populist explosive in the member states. So we are a bit worried about what is happening if that case would, would um, really come up. I don't think so. I think there's enough, enough gas for the people, but there will for sure not be enough gas for the industry, even with all the things we are doing. So the, the European states go into a deep recession at the moment, and that also can rise populist movements. So this is a bit our worrying, but beside all that, and people are really hit hard, and people have doubled three times, four times as high electricity bills, uh, gas bills is insane. People cannot pay it anymore. People will have to or might lose their house and have to go out. Um, that is a heavy burden. And for these people, it's, ex it's really, they are afraid of their existence. Uh, 
But nevertheless, the German people still show a lot of solidarity. Said, okay, we have to go this, through this. We have to stand we, uh, side by side with the Ukrainians, even if we have to carry up uh, out that burden. So there's still a positive note in all these dark times. Thank you very much. Michelle, and um, that was an enlightening presentation. So it's always good to dissect the notion, the concept. And um, yes, I, um, I, I obviously people may get that I'm fond of a little bit of statistics today. I found another interesting fact about Germany this time that in March 2022, the German Alliance of Humanitarian and Charity Organizations received around 100 million euro in donations from ordinary citizens specifically dedicated to help Ukraine. Thank you again. And um, I will encourage our members of the audience to think about questions for Michelle, for Nina. Please write them into the chat. In the meantime, we are moving to our next presenter, Professor Zdislav Mach, uh, who is a professor of sociology Social Anthropology and European Studies at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow in Poland. He is the founder of the Institute of European Studies at the Jagiellonian University and one of the main authors of the European Studies curriculum in Poland. Professor Mach is former Dean of the Faculty of International and Political Studies at the Jagiellonian University, where he also chair of European Cultural Heritage of Europe. His research interests cover issues such as nationalism, minorities and ethnicity, the development of European citizenship, migration, cultural construction of identities, collective memory and cultural heritage, as well as the development of the idea of Europe. Professor Ma has been leading teams of researchers in the Polish National Science Center in the EU-supported projects, including the SIX framework and Horizon 2020. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Natalia, and thank you for the nice introduction. Um, this is, of course, a great pleasure and a privilege to be able to speak um, in this seminar, in this webinar. Um, <clears throat> my, <clears throat> sorry, my main, my, the, the, the topic of what are these few minutes of my, uh, my talk is going to be solidarity. Um, so, uh, Michelle, thank you for, for outlining the the concept of making some kind of general reflections on, on what solidarity means. Um, this is, of course, a very important sociological category, sociological concept, and, and um, this, uh, what, this, to, to, this seminar, this webinar, gives me an opportunity to um, uh, say a few words about what uh, was a, a puzzle uh, for many, that is why the Polish society, which uh, and uh, not a particularly good reputation regarding solidarity, especially with refugees, um, uh, turned out to be uh, able and willing to show um, a lot of solidarity to Ukrainians. What is the what are the reasons? What is the um, so sociologically? This is a very interesting uh, question, also uh, for me. Um, uh, historically, relations between Poland and Ukraine has not always been very good. Um, uh, Poland uh, uh, dominated culturally, politically, Western Ukraine for a long time. Western Ukraine was part of the Polish state, um, uh, and uh, this uh, one one can talk about uh, the kind of. Uh, um, the colonialism um, uh, that um, Poland uh, developed, the colonial um, uh, attitude towards um, Western Ukraine. I would, <clears throat> I would say a few words about it in a moment. Um, but uh, since Ukraine became um, an independent state, there was a question of relations um, between Poland and Ukraine, especially regarding the memory and responsibility and there's been a lot of mutual uh, mutual resentments accusations uh, looking for the responsibility who is responsible for what and there were atrocities on both sides and injustice on both sides and uh, they didn't make anything any relations any better 
Mm, of course, uh, politically, uh, for this uh, this was uh, all depended on whether talking about right wing nationalist um, uh, organizations, which we have, um, which exist both in Ukraine and in Poland, or whether while the pro European and more central and left um, parties were more willing to think in terms of common future, common responsibility. I think that's a, the most important challenge that we have been also in Europe, but also in mutual relations between different countries is how to um, uh, reconstruct, how to, how to um, move from looking for um, uh, responsibility uh, of particular partners, particular countries, to um, thinking in terms of our joint responsibility for our, for, for our joint future. Mm, so uh, until very recently, until last year, really, there were a lot of discussion about uh, mutual guilt and 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 um, wrongdoings um, on, on between Poland and Ukraine. While at the same time, the Polish state has been uh, consistently uh, supporting uh, the Ukrainian efforts to join the European Union. This was why it was, one can explain it in different ways, certainly strategically it uh, it is and it would be uh, to Poland's benefit uh, to, have, to have sovereign, um, independent, strong and uh, be member of an EU uh, from, uh, between Poland and Russia, obviously they were thinking this way, but also there was a question of um, common past, common um, history, and the feeling that Ukraine deserved to be part of the European Union, just as Poles believed that they deserved uh, to be part of the EU when uh, Poland negotiated um, uh, the membership. Um, solidarity, the concept of solidarity in Poland has a, very, has a very special meaning because this was the name, as some of you may remember, there was a name of the trade union, uh, so the huge organizational, national organization in Poland led by uh, Lech Wałęsa, a solidarity organization, which was one of the first steps towards um, the end of the communist um, uh, domination in Eastern Europe. So solidarity is like a sacred word in Poland. On the other hand, um, uh, the experience of functioning of Poland in the European Union, uh, the experience of it shows that, um, well, put it this way, um, uh, especially the Polish governments tend to um, think along the line that um, Poland deserves solidarity from others, but uh, very often Poland was less than eager to offer solidarity to others. So solidarity is something that we ask to be given, but when we are expected to give solidarity, then um, perhaps it not always uh, happened to say, uh, to say the least. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, the, the best known example of such logic was the uh, 2015 refugee crisis when Poland, um, especially the right-wing Polish government, uh, um, well, uh, refused to offer solidarity both to Middle Eastern, North African refugees and also to other uh, European EU member states. Um, this was, um, uh, I would say, a very ugly face of um, uh, at least some uh, organizations, some some people in Poland. About um, I would say that perhaps for xenophobic reason uh, this rejection of refugees was supported by the majority of the Polish population. So that was something um, I, this I was not very proud of. Um, if there was a, there was the Poland refused to offer solidarity both to or hum, the kind of humanitarian solidarity to refugees but also to other members of the of the European Union. So it was a puzzle why uh, last spring and last winter Poles behaved very, very differently. Why they uh, reacted spontaneously, enthusiastically, and very effectively to um, the, the tragedy of, of Ukrainian people and, and the massive um, uh, immigration, massive incoming of refugees from Ukraine, because indeed 
um, critical as I was um, about the Polish society and the Polish government in 2015, I, I was very proud of how Poles behaved, um, offering everybody was was engaged, people would accept Ukrainian families in in their homes, would just give up the, 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 the people who had just one or two bedroom apartments would just give give up. I mean, they would, would offer one of these two bedrooms to the Ukrainians. So uh, against their comfort, against their um, kind of practicalities, practicalities of life, they were um, willing to to help. And that was great. Everybody was really in, involved in it. <clears throat> the government didn't do much. I'm, I'm afraid later they began to offer some financial assistance, but but um, the government um, spoke a lot about how wonderful Poland and Polish people were, but um, it was it was basically a bottom-up spontaneous um, activity. So why it was? Why it was that? Why Poles reacted differently to Ukrainian refugees than to uh, refugees from Syria? Um, there are a few reasons. I'll just very briefly go through them, very, very briefly indeed. <clears throat> Let me develop in the discussion if this is needed. Um, I think that, first of all, Poles understood or thought they understood the, the nature of the conflict. Um, for Poles, the war between Ukraine and Russia is just the, 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 the struggle for freedom of people who are oppressed. Um, it is uh, the, the struggle of Ukraine against Russian aggression. There's no question about it. And Pol Poland, of course, remembers, Poles remember very well that they themselves um, used to be uh, for a long time and many times in history, um, uh, victims of Russian oppression, of Russian aggression, um, of Russian military uh, domination. So uh, it is like we understand the nature of the conflict. Uh, Ukrainians are freedom fighters and Russians are just oppressors. So, op 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 oppressors. So, and, and, and back in 2015, I don't think Polish people understood the nature of the conflict, what was happening in Syria, um, uh, what, was, what was it all about. So the level of understanding, and, and, and of course, it's a question of, you know, um, uh, to be a freedom fighter is a very good, a label to be um, attached to your forehead. I mean, if you are if you are described as a freedom fighter, this earns sympathy. If you are described as an illegal economic immigrant, as refugees from Syria were often described in Polish right wing media, then of course it it's a very different story. And and, and another factor is of course the the perception of um, uh, high uh, cultural similarity between Poland and Ukraine. They are Christians. They are. Um, they speak the language, which is uh, not very, not very different from uh, the Polish. Um, uh, the way of life is kind of similar. So um, if, um, there was uh, much less of kind of xenophobia based on cultural otherness. Ukrainians are much more us than others, um, uh, than uh, it was the case with um, Muslims from. Uh, from Syria. Ukrainians are not uh, in most part uh, Roman Catholics, but, but uh, they are Christians and therefore they don't have this um, uh, this um, image um, uh, of um, Muslims as being dangerous to the cultural identity of the Poles. But there's also, <clears throat> so, so we have this political perception of that can be um, uh, expressed as the um, uh, the enemy of our enemies is our friend. So this makes Ukrainians friends. But there's also something else. There's something which I would um, I would um, uh, describe as a post-colonial syndrome, um, the mixture of response of patronizing attitude and responsibility. So on the one hand, Poles think of Ukrainians as deserving help as deserving assistance, as being a little bit behind uh, in terms of uh, European identity, European way of life, uh, or Western way of life. And Poles think that they, this is their privilege and their duty to actually help and show the way and help Ukraine to become 
um, Western to become European. Um, so it's, of, of, of course, it's patronizing, but it's also the sense of responsibility. We used to live together in one country. Um, we Poles used to be stronger, uh, dominating, um, and, and the time has come that we, uh, I mean, there's, there's a, <clears throat> gives us a, a kind of a, a duty to, to do something for, um, for Ukraine, for Ukraine people, but also for Ukraine um, as a as um, as a country. Um, so uh, that's definitely, um, I would say, uh, there's an element of this which um, I detect. Um, there's also, of course, um, if, uh, the question of memory, and it's very interesting that it seems that since the beginning of the war. This is the beginning of Russian aggression. Um, it was like um, kind of a consensus that whatever bitter memories we may have, whatever conflicts are still to be solved, this can wait. This can be, we can suspend it. We will discuss it when the time comes. But for the moment, Ukraine is in need. Ukraine is in trouble. We have to help. We must help. We have a responsibility. And I think this is the, without being actually verbally expressed usually, this is how many people think that no matter what was in the past, we can still discuss it. But for the moment, for humanitarian reason, but also for political reason, uh, thinking about the future, um, we should do something. But I think the, 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 this, this massive support that we uh, that the Polish people uh, showed um, in, in, in spring was basically a, a really a spontaneous reaction to um, to um, uh, tragic situation of especially women and children who were in need and, and had to be helped, and this help was provided. So that's how I see it. Um, it may be interesting to, to discuss it a bit further, but for the moment, that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you for this fascinating insight. And for me, one more number. Uh, I found out a representative survey conducted by the Polish Social Research Group, uh, and that survey found out that 77% of Polish citizens took part in various initiatives to support Ukraine, including financial and material donations, volunteering activities, and hosting refugees. 77%. Our next presenter, Dr. Alessia Chomichuk, who is a historian and a writer. Uh, she has taught the history of East Central Europe at the University of Cambridge, University College London, the University of East Anglia and King's College London. She's written for the New York Review of Books, Der Spiegel, the Los Angeles Review of Books, and Open, De and Open Democracy. Olesia is the author of The Death of a Soldier Told by His Sister, published in 2022, and Undetermined Ukrainians Post-War Narratives of the Waffen SS Galicia Division. Thank you, Natalia. Your sound was breaking up a little bit, so um, I'll I'll just take over. I think, yeah, yeah, I'm great. Sorry. Apologies. No, no, that's fine. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to be part of this um, discussion. Very important discussion. So my talk, um, the, the the title of my brief talk is epistemic distrust. Uh, this in 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 quote in um, brackets for now. Let's let's see where it takes us. Learning from the other Europe, and these are essentially observations. Uh, from the last six months, observations that, that I collected as a scholar, as a historian, but also as director of Ukrainian Institute London, um, you know, de dealing with uh, the public reaction, I suppose, to Russia's war in Ukraine, um, based in London. Um, so I, I will actually touch upon some of the questions already raised by previous speakers, especially in the previous presentation, in particular relating to Poland. Uh, and then I'll be very happy to elaborate in the in the Q&A. So when Russia began its full scale invasion uh, of Ukraine, there were many uh, in Europe who did not expect Ukraine to last longer than about three days. Um, this this belief in the de determination and unity of the Ukrainian people meant that the much needed weapons and other aid uh, arrived late, because why would you arm a state that's going to fall in a few days? Um, and that also meant that more military and civilian, uh, more military and civilians were killed by the invading troops than would have been the case had the necessary provisions been supplied in advance or at least promptly. 
And so this journey from um, of the international community um, that the, the, the international community made from ignorance uh, of Ukraine as a country and Ukrainians as people, um, and perhaps indifference towards admiration that we're witnessing now and finally support of Ukraine was very fast, it was speedy, but in my view, it is still incomplete. Um, a lot has changed in the way Ukraine is perceived and understood around the world over the last six months. But in my view, what is missing is the discussion of why this crash course in Ukrainian studies uh, was needed in the first place. Why our knowledge around the world of the country of Ukraine and the region more widely was so poor um, and how this affected uh, the decisions made by our political leadership, the decisions that I mentioned earlier relating to the support of Ukraine that Ukraine needed so badly. And one immediate observation that springs to mind is that um, the farther away we find ourselves from the war zone, the hazier our understanding of the origins of this war is. Um, and the lack of contextual knowledge um, is not perceived as an obstacle in the decision-making processes that are of um, utmost significance to the chances of Ukraine's survival as an independent state. Now, the countries that have found themselves in close proximity to the war zone um, that has now essentially stretched throughout the whole of Ukraine were the ones that were the first to receive Ukrainian refugees. And they were the ones who declared um, their support for the Ukrainian people's fight in defense of sovereignty most unambiguously. And they were the ones who called for most uh, for more support for Ukraine and tougher sanctions against Russia. But it's not just the geographical closeness to the front um, and the, the realization that should the war spill over across the western border of Ukraine, they will be the most affected by this spillage um, that made their resolve stronger. It is also the experience of Russian imperialism, be it of the Tsarist uh, type or the Soviet type that, had, uh, that, that they had in common with Ukrainians. Poland was partitioned in the 18th century with Russia's involvement and lost its statehood for 123 years. In the 20th century, um, the USSR together with Hitler destroyed the Second Polish Republic. We approaching the sad anniversary of the 17th of September. Um, September. Um, and communist Poland, of course, uh, felt the watchful eye and a threatening fist of Moscow until the USSR collapsed. The Baltic states have a vivid memory of imperial Russification and Soviet occupation. Uh, no one has forgotten 1956 or 1968, and I know you might be thinking of Auburn's uh, Hungary, uh, but I believe it serves as an exception that perhaps proves the rule in the region. And while there are some irredentist moods uh, in the region, on the whole, those states who have felt uh, Russia's brotherly uh, embrace at some point in their history know full well the potential this embrace has to suffocate those whom it embraces. Now, while those who were lucky enough to have found themselves further west can debate how not to provoke Putin, we still hear these conversations, or how to let him save face, East Central Europe knows that the very existence of a democratic Soviet, a sovereign state um, is provocation enough for the aggressor to carry out his provocation. And that it's Ukraine, its independence, its territory, and its people that need saving, not Putin's face. So if we are to truly change the way we understand Russia's war against Ukraine, the first thing we need to admit is a lack of knowledge on our part about what Russia actually is, rather than what we've imagined it to be based on the 19th century classics that we've read about war and peace or crime and punishment. The second thing we need to admit is our lack of willingness to trust those who do possess this experiential knowledge of Russian imperialism and to make that knowledge central in informing our decisions relating to Ukraine. Um, I have no intention of romanticizing the solidarity in East Central Europe. It is strong, absolutely, but it is also situational. It's driven by domestic concerns and the Kremlin is now testing it with its energy blackmailer. And we've already seen you know, protests in Prague not so long ago. But what I do want to emphasize is that unlike those in Paris, Berlin, London or Washington, 
those in Warsaw, and I am in Warsaw at the moment, or those in Prague for that matter, were not surprised to see Ukrainians defend their land with their lives. Historically, they've seen Ukrainians fierce fight for their rights and territory, including when they found themselves on the opposing sides of the state building projects. Past wars between Ukrainians and Poles have been instrumentalized by political groups in both countries for decades and have harmed the relationship on the state level um, as well as on, on the level of ordinary people. Now, however, the understanding of Ukrainians' dedication to their statehood, their freedom and their sovereignty that Poles have more perhaps than anyone else in the region gives them um, certainty that Ukrainians will fight until they win. And this certainty in turn informs the dedication with which Poles continue to be Ukraine's most enthusiastic allies in words and deeds. And this solidarity demonstrates that past wars and difficult historical memory can be, if not overcome, I'm not being that optimistic, uh, but they can be at least put to one side in the face of contemporary existential threat. Um, this unity is likely to have irreversible positive changes in how Poles and Ukrainians view each other in the future. The partnership we are witnessing today has um, potential to dwarf um, past disputes. The old Polish slogan uh, later adopted elsewhere in the region for our freedom and yours uh, has been revived um, and it has acquired very real meaning throughout East Central Europe. Ukrainians keep emphasizing that they are fighting for their sovereignty, but also for freedom in the rest of Europe. And this statement is not perceived as some sort of romantic rhetoric by Ukraine's immediate neighbors. It is perceived as a fact of this war. Living in London, I know that people don't, it, people in London don't have the same understanding of the war. They do not feel that Ukrainians are somehow fighting on their behalf, as people say in Warsaw do. They have no knowledge of Russia as a direct threat to their livelihood. The anger over gas bills is directed at politicians in the parliament in London, and it is not necessarily linked to the Kremlin's weaponization of energy. The worries over the rising cost of living are not necessarily associated with Russia's use of grain um, as a weapon of war. And, and succumbing to war fatigue and Ukraine fatigue is not perceived as playing directly into Putin's hands. Um, at the other end of Europe, those who know about the Holodomor, Stalin's man-made famine of the 1930s, are not surprised to see Russia manufacture grain crisis that can lead to another major famine. Those who are familiar with the Katyn massacre of 1940 by the NKVD perhaps are not shocked by the killing of Olenivka prisoners of war by the Russians in July 2022. Those who have grieved their loved ones in the mass graves of Stalinist terror are not surprised by the sight of the mass graves in Irpin, Bucha, and now what we see in, uh, being uncovered in Izum over the last couple of days as well. Unlike in Paris or Berlin, those at the other end of Europe do not force Ukrainians to speak on the same panels with Russians, to discuss reconciliation, to shake hands. They understand why Ukrainians think it unfair that Russians flee in the regime and Ukrainians flee in the bombs that that regime has sent to destroy their homes and their lives are treated as victims of war, of this war on an equal footing. They do not think Ukrainians insensitive for expressing rage, anger, or even hatred towards the nation that has claimed to be a brotherly people, but has in fact chosen to become their enemy. They know that it's insensitive not to feel outrage on behalf of those who are being targeted by this unprovoked aggression. At the other end of Europe, they know how important it is to call a spade a spade, not a crisis, but a war, not separatists, but Russian proxies, not the Ukraine war, but Russia's war against Ukraine. Because language matters. Language too is used as a weapon of war by the Kremlin. Using the shield of neutrality in the, in the name of responsible reporting that we've seen in the media, mainstream media all over um, Western Europe is in fact irresponsible. There is nothing responsible in saying that the Russian state says that Ukrainians shell their own civilians when we know it to be a lie. Such reporting is naive at best and outright harmful at worst. Historically, 
the role Ukraine played in old Europe's imagination has been that of no more than a buffer zone. And that has led it to be turned into a war zone on several occasions in the past. Historically, Moscow has been appeased as a threat, as a situational ally, or as a potential enemy. And this appeasement often happened at Ukraine's expense. The most recent appeasement in 2014 enabled the aggressor to present itself as a neutral party at various pseudo peace negotiations about the war that it had started. Those who call for Russia's appeasement today must realize that the only way to exit this war before, you, um, before Ukrainians win it is by shutting the doors of Europe in Ukrainian people's faces. By keeping them on the outside, by keeping them in this buffer zone, and for that reason, in a war zone. It seems counterintuitive not to appreciate calls for peace that we hear all over continental Europe, in particular Western Europe. I don't hear them quite as much in the UK at the moment yet. Um, it seems counterintuitive not to appreciate them, given the, um, the brutality of this war and how, how many lives uh, Russian shelling is, is claiming. But the question we must ask ourselves uh, now is what sort of peace we can secure. And if we have learned anything from the last six months and from initially not trusting Ukrainians with our own country, it is that we must listen to what Ukrainians say about how they see this peace. For Ukrainians, there will be no peace while any part of Ukraine's territory continues to be occupied because occupation means persecution, torture, abductions, and killings of Ukrainian citizens. And tolerating it, as we know already, we've had eight years of that before the full-scale invasion, gives the green light to the aggressor to keep going. For Ukrainians, there will be no lasting peace without justice. And justice means holding to account the perpetrators of war crimes of all calibers, and not concerning ourselves with how to allow the main war criminal to save face. If Europe wants to stay united, then old Europe needs to realize that its claim to superiority does not automatically translate into knowledge. It needs to listen to those for whom this war presents an existential threat. It needs to explain to its populations that while they complain about energy bills, and I understand these complaints fully, thousands of Ukrainians have no homes to heat because the Russian army has destroyed them. It needs to make it clear that this is our common war, and the cause of it is the same. It's in the Kremlin. Six months is enough to realize that we made mistakes and to begin to correct our misconceptions, but it is not enough to dismantle the foundations on which these misconceptions were built. But without the structural change, the situational knowledge that we've gained of Ukraine will disappear as soon as the war is over, if not before. How do we bring about this structural change? First of all, by ensuring that we do not have to rely on a crash course um, in Ukrainian studies, catching up with the knowledge that we lack, that this knowledge has to be made available widely, excessively, and permanently. And I'll be more than happy to discuss the various uh, ways that we can perhaps begin to, to ensure that this does happen. Thank you very much for giving me this platform. Thank you very much. You brought our attention to the role of language and how important the words are. Even the small thing like the Ukraine, and this is just one article in, in English language, but it is an important article, same like the Crimea or Crimea. So we could go on and on. But uh, thinking about how to follow up your presentation, I actually looked into the Global Soft Power Index 2022. You mentioned the power of imagination, the power of narratives, the power of perception. So that particular survey in 2022 found that the global perception is 4%, influence by 24%, and reputation by 12%. And then the same survey continues. The unprecedented media spotlight on the conflict and a global rally of support for Ukraine in the face of aggression have had a positive knock-on effect on the nation's perceptions across most other global soft power index metrics, even those unrelated to the war effort. And international research into branding, nation branding research, confirms that a new brand of Ukraine is quickly emerging globally. Ukrainians are fighters. And I suppose I'll stop my 
commentary here and uh, say big thank you to all our panelists one more time. And I will invite members of the audience to post your questions into the chat. Uh, in the meantime, we already have uh, the first question um, which arrived to us. Uh, potentially, I could read this question and then invite the panelists to answer. It was, it's not directed to a particular panelist. Our panelists, would you like to comment about the leadership and the image of a leader who stays and doesn't run? I, I mean, I, we've talked a lot about whatever Ukraine has been discussed. Zelensky obviously pops up, which is understandable. And there's one thing that I, um, uh, one um, sort of um, understanding of his position that I really enjoyed hearing was from Serhii Plachy. And I am uh, terrified of um, misreporting what he said. So I'm paraphrasing, but essentially he said something like Zelensky is very good at reflecting the mood of Ukrainians, of the Ukrainian people. So yes, we, he, he, his actions were absolutely brave and, and correct and courageous and so on. But that was what was expected by the Ukrainian people of the leader. And he felt the mood of his people and did what was expected of him. And I think we must remember that. Uh, so yeah, very, very good to obviously give him credit where credit is due. Um, but let's remember who encouraged him to be courageous, uh, yeah, and continues to, and continues to encourage. Thank you very much. Any other additions from our um, other panelists? Okay. Um, thank you for the question. And. Um, while we're waiting for more questions to arrive, I suppose I have two questions, uh, one to Michelle and one uh, to Zdislav. Uh, the first question is actually about um, this, I suppose the triangle of solidarity, energy and green deal. We know how the European Union is a proud leader, a normative leader in the field of environment, climate protection, uh, climate fighting climate change, environmental protection. and. This is the European Union's image around the world, but this particular um, this, this 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 year probably has introduced something different. So, if you could comment on that triangle of energy solidarity and green deal, that would be um, would be very helpful to understand the, even the bigger complexity behind term yeah. solidarity and what it means for Germany. And um, I suppose I'll ask my question to Zdislav now, and then I'll give the floor to Michelle. Um, um, don't you think that the fact that um, there was previous a lot of previous contacts with Ukrainians, and you mentioned that it's a historical context, but specifically in the recent years and after the 2017 uh, decision of the European Union to uh, grant a no visa entry for Ukrainian citizens into the Schengen zone, we've seen um, more Ukrainians coming into Europe as tourists, as as, as professionals, as um, students, as labor migrants. And um, there were more and more these direct contacts between Ukrainians and citizens of Europe. And the surveys show that people who had direct contact were among the first to start helping um, just because. So don't you think that part of the explanation why Poland is because of that very recent, since 2017, contact between Ukraine and Poland and other European states. But I'll give the floor to Michelle first. Yeah, thank you, Natalia, for that question. Uh, that's uh, that's a very complex triangle, I have to say. And um, I mean, we are all aware that Europe, but especially Germany, um, was running into problems because of the energy dependency on fossils. Uh, we knew that, nobody wanted to listen to it. Uh, a lot of people said it years ago. Uh, the EU said since many years we have to differentiate, we have to diversify our um, energy uh, uh, supply, but uh, the thing is that the German, especially the German economic development was built on cheap Russian gas, we have to admit that, and uh, so it was a whole complex situation of politicians didn't want to change, industry didn't want to change, and actually our wealth was built on that too. So we're in that situation now. Uh, it gives us that, that energy crisis, which is not only uh, because of the war, but the war was 
uh, reinforcing it dramatically, um, gives us like a, a push in the European Green Deal, which we have, wouldn't have expected. Because we have now the whole development we wanted to do since uh, till 2030, 2050, we have to do that in half a year or a year, you know? So um, that is not so easy. Um, the European Commission is pushing for higher targets because what we have only two options, you know, if you don't have enough gas and maybe later on not enough electricity, you have uh, to go down with the demand and you have to go up with the supply because actually literally over 50% of the gas is missing. So you have to have new supply and you have to go down with the demand. De going down with the demand in winter will be really a challenge. At the moment, we are already down 15%, but I, I, I mean, I counted it, a lot of people counted it. We are missing in winter 20 up to 30% of our gas. Um, so demand has to go down. At the same moment, we have to have new sources. A little bit of gas sources will come through new LNG terminals now being built in Germany, but and they might be ready in winter already. Um, but what we have missed, and this is a clear political um, mistake, we have missed to build up renewables and we have missed to uh, do enough energy efficiency measures. So the EU is setting up targets and they are increasing the targets. You know, we have to build 20% more renewables and now we are in 45% more renewables, uh, the same for energy efficiency. The problem is that exactly in that part the EU doesn't have competences. You know, we have the sovereignty um, built in the Article 194 of the Lisbon Treaty, who says, "Yeah, we can do in, in at the European level, we can do this um, uh, uh, energy policy." But when it comes to the decision of the member states, hands off. This is not European business. The member states can do as they want. So we have here a soft governance. They can agree to do it, but there's no sanction. And that's actually is, was the problem and is still the problem. And only increasing the targets will not help because we are not meeting even the targets which are down. So we are increasing the targets without increasing our ability to guarantee that member states will, will reach the targets, will implement it, will run us into deep problems. So the EU has relied the same as Germany many, very much on the price signals. They set up the ETS, the emission trade system, and think, okay, if the prices are going up, people will change. Now the prices are up, but too fast. People had no time to react. Actually, in Germany, if you want to insulate your home, if you want to change to a, a heat pump now, you don't have the people doing it. You don't have uh, the material and so on. That means before 20. Three, end of 23, you will not be able to react. So this is our high ambitions, but we will have problems to follow up with it. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's, it's, it's a very complex problem. And I think it's to dot, 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 it is to be continued because there are no easy answers. Thank you. Um, Zdislav, would you like to continue with your answer? And then we have more questions in the chat, and I would encourage our contributors to check the chat and see what the questions are of interest for you to answer. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, it's simple. I think that indeed, um, as you suggested, I believe that 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 intensive day-to-day con -day working relations and contacts with Ukrainian people do help uh, especially to overcome uh, kind of you know prejudices based on uh, ignorance and uh, you know it is not without reasons that uh, when uh, in 2015 um, there was a, an idea that um, Poland would, would accept at least some uh, Syrian refugees the the government, uh, the peace government, uh, right-wing government, um, uh, bluntly refused because they accept even one family because they knew that once the refugees acquire human face, they become uh, treated as humans. While before they come, if no one appears, if no one shows the face, you can talk about them as in abstract terms, as a crowd of dangerous uh, terrorists or whoever, or, or aliens. So 
the presence of real people really that, that does make difference and before the war Poland had uh, for a long time about no one knows exactly but about a million of Ukrainian people uh, working uh, in 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 Poland um, and of course uh, playing an important role in in Polish economy this was a typical case of you know uh, uh, economic immigrants they 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 came because uh, the, the level of uh, you know, income and wages were much higher in Poland, a few times higher than in Ukraine. So obviously many people came and, and they became known as uh, not only good workers, but also as people who were not all that different, <laughs> which, which in the Polish society, which was not so much used to the cultural diversity, was an important issue. So Ukrainians were known as people who were not classified in this uh, category of alien strangers, people who were different, who wouldn't uh, integrate and so on. Everybody knew that they would integrate and they could, they were just uh, quote unquote like us. So um, this of course facilitated, absolutely. But um, I think the most important thing was that there, was, um, there were just humans in need and also people whose Problems we understood because we have, they were victims of the same oppression that Poland experienced uh, for long. Well, I think Olesia spoke about it very convincingly and very, very well. So I think this doesn't need to. But there are interesting questions asked also by other uh, members of the audience. So maybe we can uh, take some of them. Thank you very much. Um, there's another interesting question. Do you believe it is strategically beneficial for Ukraine and the West to treat the Russian democratic opposition as an ally? Or is it politically more expedient right now not to make any distinctions and treat all Russians as a threat, at least while the war is going on? Um, anyone would like to answer that question? Okay, Alessia. I'm, I'm happy to start. I'd love to hear what others are thinking as well. Um, maybe my my answer will be predictable. Uh, so uh, we often notice that with Russian liberals and Russian opposition, um, that liberalism and oppositional activity ends with Ukraine uh, or with the Ukrainian question. You know, is the infamous. Uh, it could be summarized by the infamous uh, expression. Uh, by of, 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 uh, observation of Crimea question by Navalny, you know, when he compared it to a sandwich that can be back, uh, passed back and forth, right? So um, what I'd like to say is I will struggle to take any Russian opposition um, seriously uh, until I see that there's uh, one uh, leader uh, of that opposition that is uh, like uh, Gedrot, uh, that will say, um, you know, uh, we, whatever happens, we respect Ukraine's uh, territorial integrity. We will never question uh, any borders uh, with Ukraine. Uh, and we'll have that kind of thinking. I don't see that either existing at the moment. And second, when I see appetite among Russian society for that kind of leader and the support of that kind of leader, and I don't see that either. Um, and I'm not just saying it as a Ukrainian, I'm also saying it as someone who has quite a lot of family living in Russia, a family that has stopped talking to me mostly in 2014, and then gradually, even when my brother was killed at the front in 2017, and then right now, basically, no one is in touch. Uh, and that's, you know, that's still not such a bad uh, situation. Lots of uh, Ukrainians have a lot of abuse coming out from their families uh, who live in Russia. So, um, yeah, I don't see that appetite for that kind of leadership in Russia and that kind of support for, for, the, for the opposition that will say we respect um, Ukrainian borders, uh, Ukrainian territorial integrity, we will never question it. And also the other thing is that um, what I don't hear is complicity, is recognition of complicity of um, the Russian people uh, and not just trying to blame everything on one individual, on Putin. That is lacking too. Mm -hmm. Well, if I may, uh, I think I agree. Um, this is absolutely true that the certain, um, well, I mean, to, to treat some Russian, Russian people, Russian institutions uh, as, as members of the 
the free society and, and uh, I mean it, it requires certain commitment to certain values and if this commitment is not there then then it is it, it shouldn't be I mean we should uh, uh, simply show to the to, to, to Russian people that we are not accepting any uh, I mean it, support to I mean, for instance we were very uh, unhappy I mean we were not happy with it but we had to uh, terminate relations with some uh, university partners um, if their authorities university authorities supported Putin um, even if we understood that not everybody in the academic community did it but if the institution declares support to Putin we cannot absolutely we cannot accept. but on the other hand of course we also know that there's no other way to end the threat which Russia is as a nuclear power than if there is a, a liberation and an anti-Putin, an anti-dictatorship movement from the inside. That's the only hope that Russia would change if, 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 the, if the change comes from the inside. So we should support those individuals and institutions which are genuinely democratic and open and and who actually reject all those uh, that we cannot accept that Alessia was talking about so I think that's a that's a matter of uh, we have to be very careful with this there's also another question which I thought very interesting which may, we, may, we, we may like to take is that why western countries are not I mean they, there's a certain um, hesitation and they are careful with showing the uh, support to especially military support to Ukraine and the question is why um, and of course this is also an interesting question why it's happening one obvious answer is that probably um, everybody is afraid that if Russia is desperate uh, if it's actually losing the war in the way they may think is dangerous for Russia itself they may use their military um, potential which of course no one would like them to use and you know this is how to avoid this this is probably a concern that politicians must have on their mind thank you very much Nasinina is back so looking at other parts of the world australia new zealand what are your observations when Ukraine could be seen so far away, it doesn't affect these far away locations. But uh, what non European countries can learn from the lessons of European solidarity? I, I must say, I was, uh, I was very much impressed by the um, very early reaction and the sensitivity that New Zealand showed to the situation in Ukraine. Um, even prior to the invasion, um, the foreign ministry reached out to talk about how we were preparing humanitarian assistance deliveries, for example. And I think this is very telling, in particular for a country like New Zealand that has multilateralism and the rules-based order in its DNA, because it understands as a small country located so far away from um, everything else, it needs a rules-based order that works in order to protect its rights um, and to, to be able to trade and to be able to survive maybe as well. Um, so um, this sensitivity led New Zealand to take unprecedented sanctions um, that, uh, that uh, they had been very reluctant uh, to, um, to introduce. And it was a matter of uh, weeks that uh, sanctions were um, stood up from scratch. And um, also in terms of uh, lethal and non-lethal equipment uh, and in terms of training missions that now New Zealand Defence Force is training Ukrainian soldiers in UK. I think that is a very substantial um, contribution that New Zealand provides um, in support of Ukraine and for very good reasons, notably those that I mentioned also in speaking, this is not about Ukraine only, it's about much, much more. The fact that might is not right. Um, that is very, very important that the international community stands together there. And, and, um, and I think there was another question about um, what New Zealand and, and Australia could possibly learn from, um, from Europe when it comes to education and refugees. It's of course, 
it's of course not uh, not for me to um, to um, tell New Zealand what to do in terms of its um, refugee quotas. And also there, a lot has a lot has happened with the family uh, visa for for Ukrainians that uh, that New Zealand um, opened. I think um, what will be necessary and also for a sustained time is to uh, maintain the solidarity also beyond the direct support to Ukraine um, in, a, in the context of um, uh, humanitarian assistance and food assistance to other countries as well, where New Zealand as a strong uh, partner and a contributor to the, to the UN might want to, um, might want to tip on, chip in. And just a very brief comment for me. I know I'm a chair, I'm not supposed to talk much, but <laughs> I am a Ukrainian who lives in New Zealand. And the speed with which the government adopted this special visa for Ukrainian refugees who are related to citizens and residents was unprecedented. Immigration offices are always bureaucratic and heavy, mm -hmm. but the speed, the respect, the personal attitude, and not only for that particular visa category, but other visa categories, there was definitely a lot of understanding mm -hmm. and you could see compassion and, uh, yeah, and um, I, I would like to second Nina's, Nina's um, uh, comment on to this question. Um, there is another question here, so I was sort of moving from um, uh, assistance to refugees to military assistance. One dimension of solidarity was Ukraine's military assistance to help Ukraine not only stop the Russian invasion, but to drive the aggressor from Ukrainian territory. How can one explain the reluctance of governments of some EU states to give Ukraine the tools necessary for this? Why, for example, is Germany still reluctant to give Ukraine serious weapons, leopards and martyrs? I'm going to mispronounce, and that can strengthen Ukraine's counter offensive. Um, I suppose it's sort of a question to everyone, but I don't know who would like to start first. Maybe I can take this one. Um, okay. Yes, I mean, for sure, um, I can very much understand the asking for heavy weapons. Uh, the Europeans are a bit reluctant, they don't want to be dragged into a whole European war. This was especially the argument in the beginning of the war. I think this is changing now. Um, for Germany, you have to understand, I mean, that is a whole, what, what Scholz has done, the, the chancellor, is a whole U-turn uh, of what Germany did before. We have that heavy burden of being the terrible aggressor in two European and world wars. Um, it's not easy for Germany to get involved in a war and to deliver weapons into a war. Uh, so that was really a U-turn, a 180 degree turn. It was a Zeitung Wende. That was not an easy one. Um, the reluctancy now is getting a big opposition. There's a heavy discussion about delivering Marda and Leopard. Um, I think they will. It will take a little bit more time. This is the time thing is understandable. I know also in Germany, we think, okay, why can that not be a, a lot faster? Uh, but sometimes things take time and they actually none of the European countries has delivered such weapons yet. Uh, they always say they will do it in cooperation. Hopefully there will be a movement now, um, but you have to understand also that, that, especially for Germany, it's not an easy decision. This is what I can say. And if I if I maybe um, um, add um, to this, I think um, also in terms of the support that the EU member states have given, um, we've used for the first time our European peace facility, the irony of it, <laughs> to actually reimburse member states for the weapons they gave to Ukraine at the request, of course, of the Ukrainian army. So this has be, has dispersed up to now 2 billion euros. So this is a, a significant 
significant amount of money. And just also on the German contribution, there's a lot of talk about the, the tanks, the martyrs and all of this, but there is a lot of military equipment also forthcoming from Germany. And, and I think the foreign minister only said yesterday that there's basically three elements to this support. There is all the equipment that is already provided in terms of air defense, in terms of artillery, MLRS, all of this. There's also um, quite a lot of support for a maintenance hub because of course a lot of this high tech um, weaponry needs to be maintained because it uh, it, it wears out during um, during uh, the war. And the third element to this is exactly the margins that, uh, that that you have mentioned and where the discussion is ongoing. And yes, where there is impatience um, among uh, among some um, some uh, parts. But this should not um, distract from the fact that a lot of uh, assistance has been, military assistance has been forthcoming. Thank you very much. Olesya? Just on the question of reluctance of not wanting to be involved in the war, because um, that seems to be um, also the question of calling a spade a spade that I mentioned earlier. So uh, there are countries that have been involved in the war by uh, since 2014 by continuing to trade with Russia and relying on Russian gas and oil and so on that, that's been weaponized for for a long time since 2014 since Russia uh, broke international law and invaded the sovereign country um, that has been involved in the war turning a blind eye to um, um, abuses of human rights and uh, abductions and torture and occupation for eight years. And now we know, now we all know what Russian occupation means. Ukrainians have known and have screamed about it for eight years, what Russian occupation means, because we've seen it in Crimea and the occupied parts of Donbass and not doing anything about it and sort of, you know, waving a finger at Russia that has been involved in the war. So to say that, you know, we don't want to be involved in the war more than, than necessary is um, perhaps disingenuous when, when it comes to, you know, saying that, you know, that that's why we're not supplying Ukrainians with the weapons that they are asking. Um, the other thing I wanted to say that there seems to be, uh, you know, support for uh, Ukraine to win this war, but not necessarily for Russia to be defeated, um, because everybody's afraid of defeated Russia. And I think just as has already mentioned this earlier. Um, but the question that I really want Europe that wants to stay or maintain some kind of solidarity ask itself is what kind of Russia are we prepared to live with if it isn't a defeated Russia is it the sort of Russia that will continue to meddle in our politics in every single country and try and you know keep the uh, leaders of democratic countries in, the, in its pockets is it Russia that will continue to break international law that will continue showing that you know, use of terror, violence, and blackmail is an acceptable tool of international relations because it has been for it. it I mean, it, you know, everything they've used over the last eight years has worked to their advantage because Europe essentially tolerated it. So he has been involved in this war. Let's just be honest about it. No, I, I fully agree. I just repeated that uh, that was the argument in the beginning, but with military. You know, the fear in the beginning was that the military action is spreading over whole Europe. I think that was the fear in the beginning. Um, I think we learned that, or hopefully learned, um, that it doesn't matter what we do. I mean, it's the reaction of Russia is not, it's not a reaction, it's an action. It doesn't matter what we do. Uh, and this continuously changed the argument. That was my point. And we are talking about that now and it will come. It's a matter of a little bit of time, I think. But also the fifth Rammstein, which happened recently, um, we don't know many details. We just don't. I think at this point, lots of details are not released to the general public, to the international media for, for strategic and tactical purposes. So I think um, history will look back and we'll know more details but at the moment i've heard several commentators in ukraine and in the west saying that they are not giving these details to the media or the international public so i suppose it's another part of the war at the new in the new media ecology we are so spoiled by transparency and speed of information that we really want all information immediately there because we're spoiled but some type of information might not be known for some time because of the 
of its nature and because of life and death on, um, on the stake. Um, I suppose we are approaching the very end of our seminar today, webinar today. I would like to say big thank you to our panelists, uh, big thank you to His Excellency Vasily Marashnichenko, big thank you to you, Nina, Your Excellency, uh, Ambassador of the European Union to New Zealand for your time. This is almost nine o'clock in New Zealand. Australia is a little bit lucky here, and Europe, of course, has the whole day ahead of you. I just want to say that uh, this is not the last seminar in our series. At the moment, I'm projecting, I hope you can see a poster for the upcoming webinar. It is dedicated to poetry. You can see names of um, scholars who look and, and, and poets who who will talk about Ukraine through the prism of poetry and with no, with, with no wonderful songs, wonderful poets. Ukraine always been famous for that. So it is on Friday, 14th of October at 5 p.m. Um, you can see the link and obviously Event Finder will advertise this event again. Uh, we hope you can join us in the, uh, in the future. I would like to say big thank you to our supporting team, Becky and Felicity, who have been very helpful and made sure that people can hear and see us. And again, a round of applause to wonderful panelists for time, insights, and um, interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for organizing. <laughs>